whose idea this was from the very beginning, and without her and her help, we'd never be here today. And she's here in the audience, uh, sitting in the back. Uh, we'd like to thank the, the, the ladies here at the Civic Club, especially my friend Barbara Parra, for arranging the use of this facility so we could all be here. Uh, to Sue Pockmeyer, who's behind the camera with the red something or pop on, and who is uh, who's now taking it off. Um, we want to thank her for all her technical support and logistical support, and also Sarah Lindau uh, for publicity for this. Um, we have in the back when you'll be leaving, we depend almost entirely on donations from our members, a membership from the public. Uh, there's a donation box sitting at the back. It's a little rectangular box. Uh, we have cost to put these things on. If you can find it in your heart to go by there, put a dollar, two, five, whatever you can or cannot. It's not mandatory. We really need your help uh, along those lines. So if you could do that, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, I think that's about it. You're not here to listen to me. I thank you all for coming, and uh, I turn it over to my friend, uh, Ray Owen, who needs no introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be introducing our speaker today. Bill has uh, been a good friend to me and a teacher to me for somewhere around 35 years. It's hard to believe that is isn't Bill. And I think about me giving you a call and showing up on your door, and from the minute we met, uh, just always share it. Uh, Bill believes nothing worthwhile has ever been accomplished without passion. As a youngster and Eagle Scout, he had a passion for collecting Boy Scout badges. And it is passion such as this that Bill has shared with others for his entire life. And he has shared this with his community at Asheboro, North Carolina, throughout the state of North Carolina and throughout the nation. He does this with individuals, with scholars, and with important institutions that are doing great study of southern uh, of surviving material culture. Institutions like, such as the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts in Winston-Salem, High Point Museum, the North Carolina Pottery Center, Greensboro Historical Museum, and this list goes on and on. Bill has been an avid collector and preservationist of uh, Piedmont, North Carolina pottery and furniture, and of course, long rifles. He's collected those for most of his adult life. His father gave him a long rifle to hang over his mantle one Christmas. It was a present in 1969. Soon after that, Bill realized he needed a powder horn to go with the rifle, and then a bag. And so Bill began collecting. He had to have a group of them. They didn't look right, but just a few. Bill views all of this, the furniture, the pottery, the, the long rifles, he views it as art, and he relishes the history that these objects represent to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Bill. Thank you, uh, Ray, and gosh, what an introduction. Uh, uh, Ray and I have been friends and well, we've been not only uh, fellow collectors, but we've also been uh, close friends. And I, uh, he seemed to indicate that the knowledge was just moving from me to him. But let me assure you that I appreciate his opinion on uh, a lot of things. And he's done quite a bit of work, I know, on, on your area, Deputy Bar. So, Ray, thank you for that introduction. Uh, before I get started... I think it would help us, because I realize there are folks in the audience that know uh, quite a bit about the long rifle or the Kentucky rifle, and then there's others that uh, do not know at this point what we're talking about. So, uh, this is a Davy Kennedy rifle. Uh, if you can leave that on for just one second. And... It has a patch box, uh, it has all of the, uh, or certainly a lot of the characteristics of the school down here, and, but it is a Kentucky rifle, or a long rifle, that is the, the barrel is held to the wood by pins, 
and there's a tang back here, of course, that holds it on as well, and many of them have patch boxes. Uniquely American. Whereas this gun is a military gun, and it has barrel bands. The barrel bands are holding the wood to the stock. This, of course, weapon was made for war. Uh, and it also has a tang, but it, and it's walnut stock, and most of our rifles in the Piedmont, North Carolina, are uh, out of maple, uh, curly maple, or, or straight grain maple. Our mountain rifles do are, are uh, a lot of them out of water. So I think it's before we even start in the lecture to kind of get that elementary thing out of the way. By the way, you can always tell on a military gun where it was made, and uh, that is American military guns, uh, where it was made and what year it was made. The date's always back here. This date is, uh, this belongs to my friend Kenneth Orr, uh, who brought it with, came down with me today, 1861, and it was made at Harper's Ferry Armory. And it's got U.S. on it, of course. But it is, so it, we know it was made in 1861. It's percussion ignition. And a military gun is, uh, the, the subject of military guns, or uh, uh, U.S. military guns, I, I don't want to say it's an easy subject, but it is so much easier than these complicated uh, Kentucky rifles. Because there's nothing on this rifle to indicate when it was made, except uh, this does have an unusual marking on the, on the side plate, 1807, so we believe it was made in 1807. But if it didn't have that, most Kentucky rifles or long rifles don't have that. So I think with that out of the way, they will uh, cut the lights and we'll Now, I did a book on North Carolina schools of long rifles, 27 years of work. And you're going, uh, we're going to share with you today some of those, uh, some of the pieces, and we're mainly going to talk about Moore County and the Bear Creek School uh, or, or the Kennedy uh, rifles. But before we do that, uh, I think that we need to learn or at least reiterate or remind ourselves of our heritage. And I'm going to read a little bit from the, uh, the introduction. I'm not going to read much. Most of it, we're just going to talk about these things and have a conversation about them. When we speak of North Carolina schools of long rifles, we're basically talking about Piedmont, North Carolina, and west to the Appalachian Mountains. In 1750, the population of North Carolina was approximately 50,000, but a flood of immigration came down the Shenandoah Valley from Pennsylvania and Maryland, uh, excuse me, came down the uh, Shenandoah Valley from Pennsylvania and Maryland, and it increased the number to 345,000 by 1775. This made North Carolina the fourth most po populous ca uh, colony, and most of this increase had taken place in the Piedmont. Now, of course, Moore County is located on the very eastern edge of Moore County, I mean of, uh, of the Piedmont. Central North Carolina became a cultural melting pot during the last quarter of the 18th century. The Moravians, Germans, Scotch Irish settled the central and western Piedmont and the English Quakers settled the eastern Piedmont in Guilford and Randolph counties. Thus Piedmont, North Carolina was settled mostly from southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, or settled mostly from southeastern Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. These new settlers brought with them a European and Pennsylvania artistic heritage that proved to be lasting though continuously modified and rearranged in the Carolina backcountry. And 
those of us that collect the furniture and and the other decorative arts know about all these little back twists that we like on our decorative arts uh, in the Piedmont. This influence can be seen on all Carolina applied art forms and crafts and call social historian Carl Breedenbaugh to uh, remark the North Carolina Piedmont was culturally an extension of southeastern Pennsylvania. This image depicts that, that most of our immigration was down the Shenandoah Valley in here into Piedmont, North Carolina. If we did have some immigration coming up through Fayetteville from up to Cape Fear, and you had some from Charleston, and then the trading path, the major trading path coming out of <coughs> eastern Pennsylvania also, uh, we, we had, we, of course, we had a lot of uh, settlers coming from that area. This high chest of drawers, which was in my collection, this, this is at Mesda now, was owned by George Faust. He was married to Barbara Kivett Faust, and it's dated 1796. At first glance, uh, those of us that collect decorative uh, arts and collect furniture would say, oh, this looks like Chester County, Pennsylvania, with these arch drawers and just the form. But on, on closer examination and along with uh, about uh, 20 other examples that I have studied over the years, and by the way, Mesda is now doing a special study of this group of furniture. Uh, this was made in Southern Alamance County. And George Faust was the youngest son of Johann Peter Faust, who had come down from Pennsylvania. This blanket chest is, uh, again, uh, was in my collection. I almost, I almost had to had fingernail prints on my kitchen floor as this was taken out of my house. But it is in Mesta, and it is a very, it is a very important uh, uh, decorative piece from Piedmont, North Carolina. Actually, I purchased this, and it came descended in a family just north of, uh, a few miles north of Bennett on the Chatham Randolph County line. But the point to these two pieces is that they, is that this, these are representative of our, of our culture, of our, of our decorative arts. Also, I put, uh, I'm showing these as an example uh, to give us a, a uh, to let us know a little something about the rifles. The early rifles from about 1760 to say in the 1790s were probably, uh, uh, many of them I feel like are misidentified. And because the regional characteristics as I see it and as I have found over the years, probably didn't start developing until the late 1780s, 1790s. And many of these rifles were misidentified today as Pennsylvania or Virginia because when, as, as I uh, argue with my uh, good friend Wallace Guster from up at Colonial Williamsburg, when they crossed into the North Carolina line and they got down here and then, and they were, they were some of them were rifle smiths, they didn't say, oh, we're in Piedmont, North Carolina, we're going to make a rifle like that. They made them just like where they had just come from. And so, I think that gives us a, a perspective a little bit about our veteran arts. And as, <coughs> as uh, uh, Ray pointed out, uh, I'm, I actually approach my book and I approach this subject from a decorative arts point of view. That the Kentucky rifle is a truly is a art, artistic treasure in many cases. Uh, now, let's take a, a quick look. It's a little bit disjointed right here first, but we'll get to move it in a minute. But uh, where did the Kentucky rifle or long rifle come from? And 
This image uh, depicts uh, the German Jaeger and the and a uh, and a English Fowler. Again, with your permission, let me just quickly, because I think it'll be uh, for constraint of our time, uh, read from the very beginning of the introduction of my book. The Kentucky Long Rifle is uniquely American. It's uniquely American. It evolved from European forms known as German Jaeger rifles. That's that top image. And English and French Fowlers, and that is an English Fowler at the bottom. So when you combine these two, and in the 1730s and 40s, we feel like that the beginning of the development of the Kentucky Rifle and Long Rifle began somewhere between Christian Springs near Bethlehem and the Moravian community. The Moravians, of course, had been driven out of uh, Europe, but they came here and they brought with them, their, of course, their culture. And they were fine riflesmiths. And then you, and then combine that with the French Fowlers and English Fowlers, and you wind up, after a period of years and involvement, probably by the 1750s or 60s, a, a, the beginnings of the Kentucky Rifle. However, early on, uh, by the way, uh, uh, I have a note here that in the 18th and 19th century, uh, the Kentucky rifle or long rifle was referred to as a rifle gun. It's a newspaper article <coughs> from Salisbury and advertising about this fellow had had his rifle gun stolen. And a rifle gun was a uh, what we would refer to today as a long rifle or Kentucky rifle. However, uh, early on, it was sometime referred to as a Kentucky rifle since it was produced in the backcountry. And this is my theory. Uh, I've never seen this in print before. Uh, there's different theories about it. Since it was produced in the backcountry away from the seacoast, cane tuck or Kentucky was often the term used to describe the entire territory west of the eastern coastal development areas in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, and when they, when they would leave this, the, along the coastal areas, we were going to Kentucky or Kentucky. And Kentucky was this big, vast uh, territory on the frontier. To some, the use of the name Kentucky Rifle is a misnomer, but the name is now generally accepted among writers, historians, and collectors. It should be pointed out that today we also distinguish the origin of these rifles by referring to them as Pennsylvania Kentucky Rifles, or Pennsylvania Long Rifles, Virginia Kentucky Rifles, or Virginia Long Rifles, North Carolina Kentucky Rifles, or North Carolina Long Rifles. So they're somewhat synonymous. That is, and by the way, we some of us uh, laugh a little bit about our northern friends uh, not recognizing our decorative arts down this way for many, many years. But Dr. H uh, uh, Huffman uh, did a book, and he was a, he was a real scholar, and so uh, he just simply didn't know better. But he called his book the Pennsylvania Kentucky Rifle, thinking all of them were made in Pennsylvania. But of all things, guess what he put on his fly cover? A rifle from southwestern Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a very important early scholar, though, and, and some of you may even have his... Uh, have his book. His book was one of the first that I ever uh, 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 purchased. The North Carolina uh, Schools of Gunsmiths, this, a lot of this was playing some new territory and these are the nine schools that we were able to develop uh, over the years. Uh, uh, my, good, my good friend Kenneth Orr, we just talked about, Kenneth is with me Kenneth did all the photography and even helped put together this special program just on Moore County. So Kenneth, 
Uh, I really appreciate Kenneth Orr, uh, the gentleman seated right over there. I have some gentlemen seated over here on the left with a white beard. But Kenneth put all of this together. But early on, I had been researching this and working on this and owning rifles and did a paper and a program at our annual Kentucky Rifle Meeting in Pennsylvania. And that was sort of the seed for this book. Uh, and the various schools, as you can, uh, uh, as you can see, excuse me, uh, the Bear Creek School, and you're going to find out that that's, that's your local school. That's in Moore County. And why do we call it the Bear Creek School? We could have called it the Kennedy School or the Moore County School. But uh, early Deep River School up, in, up here in southern Randolph and northern uh, I mean, in Southern Guilford and Northern Randolph, the Jamestown School out here in Western Guilford, the Forsyth, uh, out here in Forsyth County, the Moravian School, or the Salem School, Davidson School, Rowan, down here in Mecklenburg, which includes these counties out west of there, the Catawba Valley up there in the uh, Catawba County and Iredale County, and then finally the Knight School. All of these rifles made out here in Western North Carolina in the mountains. And uh, which we refer to as the Appalachian School. Uh, but this, this is what we're interested in, mainly interested in today. And I think that the format that Kenneth helped me put together, if we're going to mainly talk about these Bear Creek rifles, then we'll head in and show an example of each, from each of the other schools. And then the final section of my book deals with all the Confederate arms that were produced in North Carolina. In Robbins, North Carolina, was once known as Mechanics Hill. Yep. Then, as uh, and somebody correct me on my history here, but I know it became Hemp, and then in the 1930s it became Robbins. But in the 18th century, uh, it was known as Mechanics Hill, and the and I re we called it the Bear Creek School because David Kennedy shot, and he was the main character. Everything radiates out from David Kennedy. His shop was located on Bear Creek at present day Robbins. This is a family tree of the Kennedy gunsmiths. Uh, John Alexander uh, Kennedy the Elder was the first of the gunsmiths, and he moved his family to North Carolina from Pennsylvania. And shortly after he moved here, uh, David Kennedy was born in 1768. And he is, he's the one who had the main shop. And a lot of these other gunsmiths, including his brothers and in some of his sons, worked for him. And then they had other gunsmiths as well. But there were some other gunsmiths throughout the area as well as up in the edge of Chatham and Randolph County. We're going to be talking about the Harpers and some other, several other gunsmiths. Williamson's, for example. Uh, John Alexander Kennedy almost certainly was known as Alexander Kennedy, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. David, as we mentioned, he had a younger brother named Alexander. He had an older brother, John II, and then he had five sons that are documented as gunsmiths. You'll see examples of all of these uh, uh, all of these makers along with these three right here. John III, Hiram, and E.S. Kennedy. Uh, the, we know he's a documented gunsmith, but he left Moore County pretty early, and he went to, uh, to the western uh, Piedmont. Never seen a rifle by him, nor uh, this uh, the son of Hiram. By the way, Hiram went to Alabama uh, in the 1820s and Poston took other members of the family. We don't know how many went. Uh, in 1835 or thereabouts, uh, David Kennedy uh, moved out there. But by that time, he was uh, an old man. He was destitute and probably made no rifles in Alabama. They want to say he did, but we just, most of us that have studied the subject uh, don't believe that he did. Let's 
way to learn about this subject is looking at the pieces. And that's what collectors and what uh, most of us enjoy doing. This is the very rifle that's pictured on this table. This is a David Kennedy rifle or it descended in the Ritter family. And it has a characteristic on it. It has a lot, lot of uh, uh, several characteristics of the school down of the school down here. By the way, when I say school, I'm assuming most of you know we're not talking about a formal school. It's where a group of gunsmiths lived in pretty close proximity of each other, at least uh, within uh, uh, 20, 25 miles, uh, in, in many cases, a lot less than that here in Moore County, a lot less than that. And they use similar, uh, uh, similar architecture on their rifles. They use similar engraving, similar decorative elements, similar patch boxes, whatever. This molding along the cone is a in, where it has a step. But I've only seen that in this area. I, I've never seen it on any other American uh, Kentucky rifle or long rifle. Now up in uh, up in the uh, Jamestown School, Salem School, Davison, Rowan, Mecklenburg School you will sometimes see a single incised line. Once in a while, two incised lines. But nowhere except here do we see this step. Now this step sometimes is not quite as accented as, as much as this, but even if it has molding here, it'll be raised as opposed to those other schools that I just mentioned that you don't find it at all. This shows you a little closer example of that molding. And the signature usually is on top of a barrel of a Kentucky rifle. A military gun, we pointed out earlier, oh, it's on the lock. Do not, find, do not look on the lock for the name of the Kentucky rifle or a long rifle. Usually those locks were imported. A few were made by gunsmiths early on in the 18th, 18th century, but most of them are imported either from Pennsylvania or from England. However, North Carolina is somewhat unique in that we do have some schools, not the Moore County School or the Bear Creek School, we do have schools that they did sign them on the patch box lid. That is the patch box, by the way. There's a, there's a cavity in there that they stored tallow and patches to, you know, to, uh, so that the ball would go down the barrel uh, much easier and it would be either grease or tallow of some type. And then here is a somewhat faint, but the D. Kennedy uh, signature on top of the barrel. And as I pointed out earlier, 1807. Note the finial. That's this part of the patch box. That's the finial. That's the side plate. This is side plate. This is the lid. This finial is a is a twisted star. That's a term that some several several of us uh, coined early on. And it's a vestige right out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Early Lancaster, Pennsylvania rifles had daisy patch boxes. And some of our rifles, or many of them, will really not have a star like this one, but it'll have a little daisy uh, flower engraved uh, in this upper part of the female. <coughs> also, note the patch box lid doesn't go back and touch the butt plate. It actually uh, is what has been coined a captured patch box lid. And again, that's somewhat unique to the Moore County School. Now, there are other areas of the country that may have uh, these uh, captured patch box lids, but only with a couple of exceptions that uh, when you see that, uh, we're looking at the Kennedy rifles or Moore County rifles or those rifles up in Chatham County. One other thing on this, uh, coming back to, the, uh, to here, note that this there's a release there that releases that lid. That is also something that is unique to this, uh, to this school. This is a Kennedy rifle, David Kennedy, and we show this one 
for a couple of reasons. One is this Chevron cap. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the, the Chevron cap, at least my belief, is that they probably, and I think Kenneth will probably agree with me, probably originated in Lancaster as well. And you see that on later Lancaster rifles. The two schools that you see this on in North Carolina is out in the Catawba Valley and this school. I have seen it on one or so uh, early uh, 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 Randolph or Southern Guilford County uh, 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 rifles. Now, also look at the carving pattern. Isn't that the wonderful, beautiful carving? And this shows you the carving pattern that you see in this county. Uh, not only see it on Kennedy Rockers, you see it on other on other makers here. The carving flows out from the cheek rest, but it flows uh, back toward the back butt plate, and it goes in an upper volute and then in a lower volute. That same carving pattern uh, we see repeated throughout this uh, area. Nowhere else in North Carolina. For that matter, I've never seen it really anywhere else in the country. This galoosh work, these side plates, we'll talk about those a little bit later, but that uh, is fairly crude down here compared to what you see up in Salem and uh, Davison, Rowan, and Mecklenburg. They're really accomplished uh, side plates up there. These look a great deal like what you see on the long wild rifles up in the Winchester area of Virginia. The side plate, this is very, uh, this is one of the things we use all the time to identify some of these rifles, as well as this trigger guard, this trigger guard profile. There was a rifle brought in, and of course the, the trigger guard was uh, one of the things to immediately look at and, 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 uh, and study, and without any question, one of the rifles brought in is a Kennedy rifle. This is a beautiful uh, rifle, uh, a, a David Kennedy, and it has these three little uh, Florida leaves or these little leaves in front and, and the, the rear of a lock mortise. Uh, it has, uh, here, here's the release for the patch box lid. We're not going to have time to cover everything, so we're just going off the cuff. Uh, Try to cover as much much of this as we can. Uh, this flower, that is a wonderful coin silver flower and a wonderful patch box with silver worked in the brass. North Carolina, also many other schools are known to have brass work, I mean silver work with brass. Don't find it in Pennsylvania very much. Do find it some in Virginia, but North Carolina is known for that. Look how Kennedy did this one. There he puts a silver tip back of his thimble. He's got silver all over the place. Even that's tipped and that's tipped. And we've got the captured patch box lid again. <clears throat> this rifle shows that galoosh work a little bit better than the other rifle. This patch box we see quite often down, down in this, uh, you know, on Kennedy rifles. And it has that little twisty star with that, that one has a flower uh, engraved in the finger. The side plate, no dip. This particular inlay we see repeated time after time. Another rifle that a tribute to David Kennedy's shop, there is a possibility, uh, just studying and thinking about this rifle over, over uh, many years, is because of this uh, nose cap being engraved, and that's where the nose cap is. You never see that in Pennsylvania. To my knowledge, I've never, other than a Chevron cap, never seen a decorated uh, nose cap. Uh, Kenneth, I don't imagine you ever have. And uh, so here we find that. What a wonderful decorative item to find out here on the, on the uh, muzzle of the rifle. Uh, we will look at another rifle by, I believe, Brian Martindale. And he worked up in Chatham County, and he did that. So there's a slim possibility, or not a slim possibility, a possibility that Brian Martindale made this. If he did make it, he certainly were influenced and made it in the Kennedy style, because everything else points toward the Kennedy shop. The side plate, 
the patch box, uh, the trigger guard, uh, everything points to the uh, to the the Kennedys. Uh, that that's a false wedge. Again, that's a unique thing to North Carolina. And you do find it up in uh, Jamestown. You find it well. You find it on Randolph County rifles. You find it in Jamestown. You find it in uh, in uh, uh, out in Salem, Davidson, right on down to Mecklenburg. And it's not a real wedge. It's just false as decorative. And there's a little hole in there, and that's where the pin goes through that holds the wood to the stock. A really interesting rifle, all mounted in iron, except look at that beautiful silver flower. And then it has a paddle pick holder right here. There's that inlay again, and then the similar side plate. For many, many, many years, every every one that collected these tended to say that anything that had a iron, iron hardware and the, and the hardware is the trigger guard, the butt plate, and uh, and and a, uh, a thimbles that run out the four stop, even the nose cap. Uh, that any time you saw an iron trigger guard or iron hardware, that you were looking at the mountains looking at the Appalachian School, looking at East Tennessee, or Southwest Virginia, or Western North Carolina. In fact, even John Bivens, who was an absolute genius and worked at Mesda in Salem and did the very first introduction to these Kentucky rifles, or, or North Carolina long rifles, uh, was quoted as saying that anytime you see an iron hardware that, or an iron trigger guard, almost certainly the rifle was made west on the Yadkin River. Well, this book proves differently, and here's a perfect example of a rifle probably made by David Kennedy. I feel very comfortable that it was made in his shop, and he is, um, he's the, he'd be the strong candidate for this rifle. What a wonderful uh, coin, uh, coin silver uh, uh, finial. You can see the molded comb that we talked about earlier, the captured patch box lid, and look at the iron chevron cap, and then the false wedges. Everything points that way. It does not have a signature on it. It does have a name powers on it. I found that name in the Moore County uh, census, and I set that out of the book, but unfortunately it is on sign. This rifle is a, it's somewhat of a mysterious rifle to me. Uh, I have concluded that it probably was made in the Kennedy shop. If, it, if this rifle was not made in the Kennedy shop, then it was influenced. Because this side plate, that is, that is exactly what you see all the time. That's, that's the side plate we've been looking at, uh, the lock bolt side plate uh, on all these rifles that we've been looking at. And it, uh, it has a, the twisted, uh, the little twisted daisy or star. And, but it has an unusual feature of opening the patch box lid by a lever that push, you push back and the lid flies open. And I, up in the four schools of Salem, Davidson, Rowan, and Mecklenburg, that school, all of the, most all the rifles, the upper side plate has a little uh, button there that opens that door, that lid. It's the only place, by the way, that you find those in, in America. Uh, guys up north, when they see that, they point to North Carolina, and, 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 and rightly so. Also, notice that this one has that incise line. So, this rifle could have been made somewhere outside of our area here, or outside of northern Moore County, and was just influenced by Moore County, but it wasn't made very far away, because... Uh, and, but bottom line, I, I, I feel like that it, it's probably one of the Kennedy products, maybe one of the sons, uh, may even be uh, one of the brothers, but he made it a little bit differently. Got a false wedge, and by the way, that false wedge is similar to what we find on Alexander Fraser rifles up in Moore County. And that's what makes
makes us so complicated, and, but also so intriguing. They didn't simply say, oh, I'm in Moore County, I'm going to make life a lot more county. They borrowed from each other. So decorative arts and the study of decorative art is definitely not a science. It is, it, 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 it is uh, uh, you, there, you all the time are having crossovers. So look at that feature in that particular wedge. doesn't look like what we've been looking at. This is a fine pistol. This pistol was made by David Kennedy. Uh, he uh, look at his uh, look at his wonderful signature, David Kennedy, D. Kennedy and Company. Uh, while I've got it on that image, that engraving many times is what tells us that it's a Kennedy product or a Kennedy shop product. We see that repeated time after time after time. I look for that. And sometimes that's about the only thing we see that in a trigger guard to help us distinguish, particularly if it doesn't have a patch box. But let's, uh, let's jump back here for just a second. A Kennedy or Moore County or Bear Creek characteristic that you don't see on other schools, you do see on some early English rifles and other English guns, but is this upper four-stop molding. Now, it does have lower four-stop molding right there, and it has wonderful carving around this back uh, rear radlock pipe. That carving is right there, and then it's also right there. But that upper four-stop molding, only this area, have seen noted that on any North Carolina rifle. Side plate, of course, we're uh, that's the same side plate. This this one uh, isn't that signed Jay Davis. Uh, Davis is a pistol. It's signed Jay Davis. Yes, I I discovered this pistol many years ago. wasn't able to buy it. It was in a it was in Florida of all things, and the owner thought that it belonged to Jefferson Davis. <laughs> and so therefore, he wanted whatever. He wanted, he wanted through the roof for good. And, and if it had been owned by Jefferson Davis, of course, well, but I didn't want it because necessarily it was made by, uh, owned by Jefferson Davis. J, this J. Davis almost certainly was a gentleman up in Randolph County. The Davises were Quakers up there. And he, and this is, with, well, obviously look on, on here. And by the way, when this pistol was made, uh, Jefferson Davis was not probably nowhere on the scenes. I don't know if it was Jefferson Davis is... Uh, Dates. I know he was a uh, Secretary of War and other various things before uh, the, uh, the Confederate War broke out. But in any event, what a fine pistol. This pistol can be now, it is in, I was not able to purchase it, but fortunately Mezda got word of this and was able to purchase this after the man died. And this is in the Mezda collection at Old Salem. When I mentioned Mezda, we're really talking about the museum that's down at the end of the street uh, the main street in Old Salem. And any of y'all have been up there, that's a treasure you need to go. This is a D. Kennedy pistol. A friend of mine owned this many, many years ago, and I finally talked him out of this piece. Uh, he was another collector, and of course, uh, uh, I think we did some trading and so on. He was actually from Tennessee. This piece turned up in Tennessee, of all places. And it was owned by Alexander Gray, General Alexander Gray, who was a general from Randolph County uh, during the War of 1812. This rifle is a 18th century, 18th century piece and is probably by the old man, probably by Alexander Kennedy. It, it and one other rifle uh, that I've seen, and when we will show it in a moment, that signed J. Kennedy, are the only two rifles that I, I feel like that we've ever turned up that would fit his days. And this one definitely uh, would fit his days, and is signed A. Kennedy. But his name was John Alexander Kennedy. But of all things, in David Kennedy's Bible, it refers to his father, as Alexander Kennedy. So the family knew him as Alexander Kennedy. 
So thus, we surmise that then this rifle might be an Alexander Kennedy. It, it's different from uh, some of the other Kennedy rifles. Uh, I've got a wonderful beaver tail back here, which is a, a early southern characteristic, that beaver tail that's around that, uh, uh, the tang. That's the tang that holds the, helps secure the, the, the barrel to the stock as well as those pins that run out the forestock, that little pins that uh, runs through the wood into the bottom of the barrel. It's got the, look at the release back here on the left side. It has never seen this before in this area. Uh, this is the only rifle we know of, but it's got a big saddle cheek rest. You do see all that on early rifles up in around the Winchester area. It's got a trigger guard. You see this on some Harper rifles. Uh, there's even, we're going to look at one in just a minute, a Philip Cameron rifle that has a style of trigger guard, has a, a patch box uh, like we see in this area. So, we very well may be and probably are looking at the old, old man's rifle. Now, now that was Alexander Kennedy the earlier. This is Alexander Kennedy the second, and it's signed AK. Still in its, in, its, in its original flint condition, really late lock. Uh, the old man would have been dead long before this lock was ever made. We date a lot of these rifles by the locks if we can, if we got that original lock plate or lock. This one is signed uh, AK and almost certainly is Alexander Kennedy II who was David's uh, younger brother, born in 1772. Uh, Note this patch box. Probably 50 to 75 percent, uh, uh, maybe more, if it has a patch box, that right there is what we're looking at. So little Elder White, a little flower right there. Those side plates, sometimes they'll have those little glue side plates, but that's the patch box that I see more than any other uh, on the Kennedy rifles. Of course, look at the side plate again. Another characteristic down here. This is the other early rifle, that it, and it's signed J. Kennedy. It is early enough, it's late 18th century. Uh, it, it could also be the old man, but I. In my book, I didn't treat it that way, and probably, uh, I, hopefully we're correct about that, is uh, and with all these many names, and father and son and, so, and brothers, uh, it sometimes is tough to distinguish. But this, that is a really early lock with that sharp point on the back. This is an original plate, and it is signed J. Kennedy. And it says J. Kennedy and, and, and Company. Probably made by uh, John Kennedy II, that is, David's oldest brother, who was born in 1766. Uh, look at the captured patch box lid, the twisted star. Here's our carving pattern. Let's see if we got closer up on that. Look at our carving pattern, the flowing forward. Coming back in an upper volute, here we got the lower volute, we got the we got the latch that unlit, uh, 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 unlatches the patch box lid on the other side, beaver tail, uh, just a wonderful, I'm even carving on this side, wonderful, wonderful uh, rifle, the captured patch box lid as, as I said. Now, we also see a lot of rifles that look just like this. And one of the rifles that brought in it looks very much like this one. It has no patch box, doesn't have a lot of decorative uh, embellishment to it. Uh, this is a John Kennedy III. This would have been the uh, a, a son of David Kennedy. It fits, everything fits. It's got, the, it's got a, a neat side plate. It still is in its original flint condition. Don't find too many rifles that way, but, but it is. But still has good architecture. The, this pistol, when this pistol first turned
turned up. I saw this pistol in Pennsylvania for my first time, and I was a new member of the KRA, and, and I joined the KRA in 1972, for one of the first North Carolina, and I saw this pistol in about a couple of years thereafter. And they were all excited about uh, the pistol from North Carolina, and by that time it was already being learned that, uh, that we did have uh, uh, nice decorative large down this way, including nice guns and pistols. And uh, I, unfortunately, I couldn't afford it at, at that time, but it was a wonderful coin silver mounted pistol. And uh, we all then referred to it as E.L. Kennedy. It is an E.S. Kennedy, Enoch Spinks Kennedy. Uh, look at the, uh, that is an S that also looks somewhat like an L. But in the 18th century, that is the way they also made an S. But this is Enoch S. Kennedy, or Enoch Spinks uh, Kennedy. He was also a son of David, all mounted in coin silver. Uh, this piece turned up later to uh, John Dumont owned it, and he was from Connecticut. He owned it for many years, uh, treasured it, and which made me feel good because there was a Connecticut Yankee that was appreciating a Moore County uh, pistol. But after his death, it was sold. Uh, again, the price had risen so much, I, I simply couldn't uh, see the way clear. And uh, this is in a, but I do know where this is, in a West Virginia uh, collection. And the guy there treasures it very much as well. It's a doctor that owns it up in West Virginia. Remember the Kentucky Rifle Association. You can see what neat stuff it has. This is Hiram Kennedy. Hiram is another son of David. And uh, it has a little cruder engraving and some of us think, or, or, or at least we speculate, that there may have been one engraver doing most of that work in the David Kennedy shop. We don't know that for a fact, but, but, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a good uh, good theory anyway, and, and, and seems to uh, bear out by a lot of the engraving. This engraving is much cruder, and in Hiram, in the 18... Uh, 18 20s did go to Alabama. We know for sure he went. Uh, if there is a product in this book or in this presentation today that was a Kennedy product made out in Alabama, uh, this one probably uh, has the best chance of that. Uh, look at the uh, upper, that molding right along the upper uh, uh, forestock of this, of this pistol. This is, we're going to leave the Kennedys now for just a moment. We've looked at 15 pieces by the Kennedys. But now they influenced the area, David in particular. This is John Spinks. Yes, sir. Uh, was he producing his own barrels? Excuse me? Was he producing his own barrels? Uh, yeah. I would say probably so. Uh, Some of the, the, most of the early gunsmiths probably produced their barrels. They didn't produce their locks, but they produced their barrels. Now, later on, later on, certainly up in Jamestown, which, by the way, ran everybody out of business. We'll talk about that in just a second if we have time. But they, they had barrel mills up there, up on Deep River in Guilford County. And we know that there probably was a, a, a few... Uh, three or four, four or five barrel, maker, barrel makers, and that they then would sell those to the other gun stockers. But I feel like, and maybe, uh, Kenneth, wouldn't you say that the Kennedys down here almost certainly made their barrels? Yeah, Arne Cable has found documentation. Of, of he found documentation. Of their barrels. Very good, yeah, Arne. And, and one other question. In his, his, his shop, as you're facing upstream on Bear Creek, it would have been over to the left side of the creek? Again, I'm not, I'm not real sure that the site has been dug. I didn't have anything to do with that. But it is, as you go up 705 from Robbins, okay. Bear Creek, and it's up there on the left. And it's back out on the creek. 
Yeah, so it would be on the left side of the group. Yes, yeah, I group guess so. Uh, the Spinkses inter intermarried with, as well as the Williamsons, they intermarried, and there were others as well, intermarried with the Kennedys. And uh, John Spinks actually lived uh, for a while, or was born in Randolph County, right down in the lower edge. But uh, everything on this rifle points again to Moore County. Uh, look, at that, look at that molding running on that upper edge there. Uh, it's raised. Typical Kennedy type side plate. And then look at the molding running out the forestock on the top all the way back to this line. Morris. It actually runs from there all the way to there, and then the four-stop molding runs from the lower book four-stop molding just from that back thimble forward. So everything points, but we do know that John Spinks was a gunsmith, and, and uh, a friend of Kenneth and I just turned up a John Spinks, a really fine one, turned up in a family in South Carolina. Uh, or turned up down there. Uh, I guess it was a, a family, or was it brought into a country? You know? No, it was family. 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 Okay. Here's the Bryant Martindale that I talked about earlier. This is this this is an absolute. Uh, uh, this this is a this is a masterpiece as far as the engraving in particular. Uh, I mean, look look at the engraving on this patch box. Now we've got that little galoosh work, we've got the elder whites out forward, and then we got this engraving on the nose cap. But it is so appears to be so much more accomplished than the other Kennedy products we've seen. And it's signed clearly on the barrel, B. Martindale. And there is Brian Martindale, who was a, a resident of Chatham County. Uh, something I have not pointed out is see that one screw tang? Almost all of our rifles, with the exception of uh, the Catawba Valley and this area, have two screw tangs or more. Jamestown, for example, almost all of their rifles have three screw tangs. Northern rifles, Pennsylvania rifles, Northern Virginia rifles have one screw tang. Uh, the, the Kennedys did... Uh, did continue that tradition here. So when we see a rifle and have a one screw tank and we put other things together, then it, it points to this area if it's a North Carolina piece. Excuse me. This piece also is unusual in that that, believe it or not, is pewter, polished pewter, rather than silver. And, and that's been noted on some products down this way. This is Edward Harper. Edward Harper was born in 1780, and he lived near Harper's Crossroads, a few miles up the road in Chatham County. But his rifle falls right into this school. Uh, the patch box lid doesn't go back to the back butt plate. Uh, the carving pattern, it goes in an upper volute, goes in a lower volute. Uh, it has uh, little fleur de -lis in front and back. Uh, and this shows it a little bit better. That patch box lid doesn't go to the back. He even put in a separate piece of brass. What a backcountry feature that is. Just sticking in there. Now you can see the little, that little uh, Florida lead type decoration. And you can see the moldy top. And you can see some feathering. We've noticed feathering on his pieces. And a nice chevron type. Uh, uh, decorated uh, powder pick holder. Also a rifle by Edward Harper. And Edward Harper is, and John Harper, his son, are two of my favorite gunsmiths because they, they're different. They're just out. Uh, uh, let me read you in a little excerpt here about the, the, the Harpers that I have in my book. And I think that I said it here better than I can just remember uh, and just reiterate to you. The Harpers were not restricted by other craftsmen in their work of traditional long rifle making techniques. Their rifle is independent, their work is independent, 
and somewhat on a different level than other North Carolina traditional gunsmiths. Their rifles are an example of the reason many of us appreciate the provincial North Carolina back country work of our cabinet makers and gunsmiths of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Look at what he did here on this rifle. What great, wonderful sculpturing, and he did this, uh, got that old big molding on top of the cone, but he even put it down here. And then, of all things, he carved and tried to carve a patch box on here. Oh, I guess he didn't have any brass. <laughs> or the, no, but look what, and then a big old iron funky trigger guard. And this particular rifle is in the Greensboro Historical Museum. Yes, sir. Uh, what would you say is the average caliber of these, these rifles? Uh, I'm going to say the, early, the, the yes. earlier rifles had large calibers because of the game. You realize these are all these guns we've been looking at are not military. They were made. They were made for. They were at home. They were they fought you for your defense and for hunting. And so, uh, uh, the 18th century they had large calibers, and you would see uh, all the way up probably 50 caliber or thereabouts. And uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth knows a touch more about this than I do. Uh, but then all the way down to a Jamestown rifle, uh, several of them are 32 caliber. And uh, so 32 to, to, to say 60. Yes. I had a quick question to throw out there. You were talking about the two screw tangs. Weren't some of the hogger rifles out of Pennsylvania two screw tangs? The what now? Wolfgang Hogger. Now you may be right. Because that's kind of what I was. If you could actually be right. Wolfgang Hargo was a, uh, a early gunsmith in Pennsylvania, German, of course, I, I, I imagine. And so you may be right, but, uh, and I have found in the discussion of all this, that every time you say that it's this way, which I've been guilty <laughs> of uh, a little bit here, there is an exception. Well, see, that was the process that I thought was kind of unique. So Wolfgang Harga was a early gunsmith. Of course, for us to learn North Carolina rifles and learn, I've obviously over the years have had to learn about, and Kenneth and all of us have been collectors for many, many years, we've had to learn about Pennsylvania rifles. I even study New England furniture to learn about our furniture down here. We're influenced uh, by some of the New England makers, in particular the Pennsylvania makers and the Virginia, Maryland and Virginia makers. So, uh, but I will stand by my statement that most of the early Pennsylvania rifles have a run exactly. screw tank. That's exactly okay. Now, but, and most of our North Carolina rifles are going to have a two screw tank or more. And our Western North Carolina rifles out in the mountains, they even have more than that sometimes. <clears throat> Another uh, piece by uh, Edward Harper. Uh, again, uh, kind of do. Uh, uh, some of us that collect this, and some of the guys that have even commented, wonder if they may have gotten a whole little hemp. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. I'd like to admit them, I don't know where I'm going to spend the night with them. <laughs> John Harper. Uh, this, is, this has been a favorite rifle to me over the years. When you see this, these photographs really don't do this piece justice. It is a sculptured masterpiece to me. Or sometimes, uh, maybe my eyes aren't quite the same as others, but gee whiz, look at uh, this sculptured uh, uh, comb that it has, got the captured patch box lid, in fact you only put a lid there, didn't you put the side plates or anything, most of these Harpers did, iron mounting, 50 years ago this has been called a mountain rifle, but it simply is not, God does have a, uh, some brass right here, by the way this one has brass, silver, and iron. Another piece by him, and he put the little lid, but then he, he called the rest of the patch box on there. This is John Hunter. Uh, merely show this piece, 
because it signed B.L. Sanders. B.L. Sanders did work in the Kennedy shop. He later became the sheriff of Montgomery County, but his sign falls right into those uh, uh, Bear Creek style rifles with that side plate. And uh, I, I guess you've noticed that side plate on almost all of these rifles. Sometimes it's engraved, sometimes it's not. I like this rifle. It's plain. Uh, I've always enjoyed this. It's, it's uh, flint, uh, great flint condition. Has a poor man's grease hole. That's a poor man's pack block where you just put a towel right there, just swap the patch. But the architecture on it is just wonderful. But it is signed EW. I found years ago. I can't go back and find it anymore. I wanted to when I got ready to do the book, but I couldn't ever find it in a family. Uh, absolutely, uh, the, uh, the, and Edmund Williamson, this is an Edmund Williamson, and it was signed E. Williamson, and it was on 2427 out toward uh, what would now be US 220, but it was back this way somewhere uh, toward, uh, uh, toward Carthage. If anybody knows of any other Edmund Williamson, I uh, would love to, love, to, love to see this. But this is, this is a neat rock. See, you, you look at your... Moore County or your Bad Creek uh, side plate. This is Philip Cameron. He worked uh, near Cameron, North Carolina, Moore County. And look at that trigger guard. We saw that on some work on an 18th century rifle. The side plate's a little bit different. It has an original wooden patch box cover. Don't know who sure about this rifle, but it's signed James Lett right on top of the barrel. It's the only rifle I've ever seen by him, but it falls, it falls right into the architecture of the guns made in this area. And that, that particular inlay you do see on Kennedy products as well. And it does have a Kennedy style trigger guard. I believe it's made by James Lett, and he was just an isolated gunsmith out somewhere, uh, or either he worked there temporarily. I just don't know. But uh, his engraving is really crude. It was not done by the engraver that typically worked in the, in the uh, in Kennedy shop. This is an interesting rifle. It's got this feathering. Uh, there's even a possibility that this rifle is an early Edward Harper. Kind of neat carving on this, all iron mounted. Original wooden patch box cover. Left over from the 18th century. Because in the 18th century, they started out having wooden patch box covers. Uh, around the revolution, they developed brass patch box co uh, covers and patch boxes. And then the patch box by the 1790s had really become fully developed. This is a great rifle. Uh, having a history in Moore County, it fits. Everything fits. Not seen that carving anywhere else. Don't know. Don't know who made it. But... Uh, our, uh, it is a fairly early rifle uh, out of the Moore County area. Well, we've looked at a lot of the several examples of Moore County pieces. So to give you a perspective, let's quickly look at a piece from each of the other schools. Uh, let's go up into northern Randolph County, made up north Deep River. If any of you know where Randleman is, made up on north of there. Uh, and it was made by Alexander Frazier. Uh, one of the characteristics you see up there is this particular inlay. Uh, the side plate is different. It has a step to it, and they're usually always flat. It has, usually has strong lower butt stop on it. Jamestown School out in western Guilford County. The Jamestown group of gunsmiths uh, drove everybody else out of business by the uh, mid-19th century. We documented over 80 gunsmiths that worked in and around the Jamestown area. They became very proficient. They were, very, they were actually really fine gunsmiths. They worked mostly with, uh, they, some of the early ones had flintlocks. This one has a percussion ignition. In fact, this is our first gun to look at that has a percussion ignition. And somebody asked me earlier, and I'll answer the question now, when did they change over and start using the percussion ignition from the flintlock ignition? I point out in the book, I think, about 1840. The earliest Jamestown 
rifle that we know of this Daisy that I've ever seen is 1845. <coughs> we do know of flintlocks, though, way out in the mountains, way back in the bowels of those hills, that were flintlocks even after the Civil War. And up there, they did a lot of inlays. Now, this is not coin silver. This is German silver that you see mostly up, up there. They kept a high comb. That's a vestige from left over from the 18th century. And in Pennsylvania now, if you were looking at the same rifle, you will not see that high comb usually. And many of them just doesn't have quite the architecture that this rifle, uh, that these rifles would have. The Salem School, uh, and if, uh, it's, this is a perfect example of the heritage that we started off talking about. Where did the Moravians come from? They came from near Bethlehem. They've been driven out of, uh, out of Europe, and John Huss burned at the stake and all that long history. But they came, and they were granted by the king uh, a tract of land called the Wachovia Tract. And that Wachovia Tract is about present-day Forsyth County. They came to Bethabra, Bethania, and, main, and their biggest community was Salem. And we know that today is Old Salem. And their rifles, a great number of them, have an eagle finial. This is a wonderful rifle, all coined silver by John Vogler. And the John Vogler house is at Old Salem, if you, if you ever, uh, ever visit there. Down in Davison County, there's an argument that the Davison County should have been combined with the Salem, but the Davison County makers were not Moravians, but they probably were trained up there, or at least had close association with them. This is a Henry Ledford. He was born in uh, 1796 in Davison County. Actually, he was born in Rowan County, because at that time it was Rowan County. You have to be very careful about your research, because uh, Davidson County was carved out of Rowan County, and he died in 1856. Uh, but a but a really a very uh, decorative uh, patch box and wonderful uh, silver work. Now we're down in Rowan County, and Rowan is that's there's some sub schools down there, and one of those sub schools is the Eagle Rivaling Group. Show just one rifle. This is a Rifle that says made by John Eagle, so there's not much uh, question about that. This rifle was in the Mesda collection, wonderful colliery. And uh, now we're suddenly out in an area for the first time where we see signatures on the patchbox lid as opposed to the top of the barrel. We're down in Mecklenburg County, uh, wonderful rifles made down there. This is a William Black. Uh, when John Bevan did his book, and even when I did my book, I didn't know who WB was. It's signed on the patch box lid, WB. Uh, Best, I challenged them. I said, you study all these furniture far, uh, makers all the time. How about finding, and, and let me challenge you to who is WB. And so Robert Leaf, the director, and June Lucas, they researched it, and they located, and I'm sure they do. They, they've got it right. His name was William Black. He was born in 1785 and he died in 1827. Uh, what a wonderful rifle he made. So uh, just a couple of characteristics that they did out there. Look at that little extension on each, uh, on the trigger guard, on the back, the back uh, extension of the trigger guard, the front extension, but there's another little thing added there. That's a characteristic of that school. That's one of the things that we did in developing these schools is seeing and noting things like that. And this, this is one of two types of side plates we see out there. And then this particular finial we see repeated quite often out there. And then there's a little button right there that releases that patch box lid. And you find that on those four schools that I talked about earlier. Catawba Valley, you move on up the Catawba River uh, because the Mecklenburg School actually includes Lincoln and Gaston and and, and, uh, and I think the Rowan School actually includes rifles laid down in Caparish. So, uh, but when you move on up the Catawba Valley, particularly Catawba and Iredale County would be the center of the school, and the rifles out there have a late Lancaster look. The side plates, these two side plates, 
there's wood in between the lid and the side plates. And we call them divided side plates, and that's a later Lancaster uh, feature. Uh, this is the other place that we find those Chevron caps. Except out there, they're not very well accomplished, and they're just in clay. Here in Moore County, they are really accented. And it's got several other things out there. Uh, it's where you find checkered wrist rifles. Uh, they are usually high cone. That's the type of side plate you see out there, which is different now than what we've been looking at. And then the Appalachian School, the final uh, school, is uh, all those rifles made in the mountains. They look very much like <coughs> East Tennessee. Western North Carolina rifles and East Tennessee rifles look very much alike. Uh, and I point out in my book, well, one was made on the western slopes and one was made on the eastern slopes. And so, but they're out of a mountain culture. And this is an example of a mountain culture rifle. Uh, all iron mounted. This one's a walnut. Uh, one of the things I always look for on these rifles, see that trigger guard? All the other eight schools that we just mentioned, none of them, and I'm going to stand by this, I've so far I've got, uh, none of them have I ever seen with a rounded or a pointed trigger guard extension. But out there you see it all the time. And I, I didn't used to appreciate these rifles, but the more I think about it and the more I see of those guys that were way back in the mountains with no contact with the world, hand forge iron trigger guards, you know, the brass trigger guards we find here and in those other eight schools, most of them are glass and they're, they're, uh, uh, they're actually molded. Well, these are hand, hand, hand forged. This, is, this particular piece is uh, George, uh, attributed to George Whitson. It has GW on top of the barrel. Uh, the tenth chapter of my book, I deal with North Carolina power horns, and we're noted for our rings on the horn, and then we, well, that's a bone in, and they just, uh, uh, they really caught on throughout the rest of the country. They've even got, uh, and, and people are really uh, admiring and collecting these pieces now. And then I finish up by the very last section, almost did this under a separate chapter, uh, all the Confederate arms made in North Carolina. Uh, but I decided just to make it an addition. It's never been done before. I have always, uh, I've always collected uh, Civil War arms while I was doing this other, and, uh, or at least I was out dealing with them to a degree, so to speak. And uh, we added a whole section on all the Confederate arms. Never been surveyed before, how they're to identify them. I've got all the rifles, the swords, the knives, the rudiments, <coughs> uniforms, whatever. Uh, just a couple of photographs here, and then we'll throw it. Confederate armory. Uh, I photographed this down at Kingsville, North Carolina. This was established by Lewis Floyd in Wilmington. He operated there for about two years, and then he moved to, in 1863 to uh, to Kingsville. Long history. We could spend 45 minutes just discussing this armory, and and, I, and my book do, does go into uh, quite a bit of discussion of this armory. Uh, he made he was known for his sword making, and this is one of the most sought after Confederate swords in the country. It has CSA in the, in the guard for Confederate States of America. He really made a beautiful product. And then these are all of the guns. And all those guns, uh, we devote a page or two in the book discussing each one of these, how to identify them. Uh, Kenneth, for this presentation today, just put a whole group on, on, on uh, two pages. So these... One, two, three, four. These five and these top two, they are from Guilford County. And why would you think that is? Because what happens when the war broke out, 1861, all those gunsmiths around Jamestown turned their talents to making rifles and, and their, their private contract rifles with the exception, uh, well, uh, they, those seven are all private contracts. 
Now these two were by the Confederate, uh, the Confederate States government, and that's at the Asheville Armory, and then the Fable Armory that you possibly have, or probably have heard of that was down in Cumberland uh, County. I also cover in the book uh, the crudiments and canteens and and uh, uh, and tell some good stories about some of these. But let me tell you. Let's end on. Let me tell you a little bit about Major Thomas W. Mayhew of Hyde County, North Carolina. He served originally as captain of Company F. 33rd Regiment, and on his cap is 33 and NC, and that 33 is backwards, because when you look at these daguerreotypes or tin types from the Confederacy, or from the Civil War, uh, those will be backwards. Uh, he was captured in the Battle of Newburgh on March the 14th, 1862, and confined at Johnson's Island, Ohio. I feel like this photograph was taken right after he was released from and they did a prisoner exchange. This happened all during uh, the Civil War, of course. He was, uh, he was later promoted to field and staff as a major of the 33rd Regiment on August the 5th, 18, uh, on, uh, August the 5th 1862. On May the 3rd, 1863, at the Battle of Chancellorsville, Virginia, Major Mayhew was mortally wounded in the third day's charge. <clears throat> According to Major James A. Weston, who was promoted in his place and later wrote the history of the 33rd Regiment, and I quote, Major Mayhew's death was a heavy blow to our regiment. He was a brave and skillful officer and was greatly beloved by the regiment. I knew Major Mayhew well. A gentler, noble, more loyal heart never beat in the breast of man. God rest his soul. Thank you very much. Questions, or, and we may have already overstayed our time, but uh, happy. I'd love to take questions because this is a subject. Uh, I collect furniture, I collect pottery, but and I collect Confederate. But the Kentucky rifle really is my favorite favorite something. Excuse me? Well, they were very accurate. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there have been all grades of stories that's, that's told about them. And there's shooters in here that will tell you how accurate they are. They're very, they're very, very accurate. They were long optic and barrels, and I guess the longer the barrel, the little more accuracy they'd have. Uh, they went for those Jaegers and those Fowler. Of course, a Fowler shot, you know, it shot big, almost birdshot or, or uh, it was not a it was not a rifle. These are a rifle with optic and barrels. By the way, when somebody calls me and they say, uh, "I've got a uh, I've got a North Carolina rifle," and I say, "Oh, oh, you you do? I say, Is it optic and barrel? No, it's round barrel." And I said, "Well, maybe you've got a military gun. Does it have barrel bands? Uh, how's the stock held on? Oh, it's got some barrel bands. Well, I know I'm in the military rather than the other." And then. I also, once in a while, they would call and say, I've got, a, I, I've got a Confederate gun. And I said, oh, uh, I said, you've got a Confederate gun? Oh, yes. And I said, uh, uh, I said, well, I'd love to see that. I said, now, you sure it's Confederate? Oh, yes. And I said, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. I said, does it have barrel bands? It does it have round barrel? And does it have some barrel bands holding it? Oh, uh, yes, it, it does. And I said, well, on the lock, look on the lock. Remember the very elementary thing we started off with, that lock. I said, what's on the lock? Springfield. <laughs> I said, we got a federal gun, not a Confederate gun. Confederate guns are very, very rare and very hard to, uh, very hard to come by. But, uh, uh, yes, they were very 
accurate, and even uh, and then you know some of the uh, some of the actually military guns were rifled as well, even though they had round power. Yes, sir. Did Kennedy rifle ever have a number besides the inscription of the name? Well, uh, good, good good question, and we do see numbers on some of these Kentucky rifles. We are not sure what they mean. Now, up in Jamestown, we'll uh, invariably see a Roman numeral right behind the site. We don't know what that Roman numeral means. Uh, there's even Roman numerals that we find on some of these Confederate uh, swords we talked about. Later. Now, down here, if I'm not mistaken, don't we have number, don't we have Ken the Kennedys? Are the uh, and, I, and every time I say Kennedy, I really am talking about that in a real broad sense. But these Moore County rifles will have a number, number 29, or number some, sometimes. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. What they mean, we don't know for sure whether it was a production and they made so many that, uh, well, they certainly didn't make them today, but so many that period of time or what. But you do see a number once in a while. Yes, sir. In these late period or what some people call decadent period uh, rifles, have you ever come across platinum inlays? Platinum inlays? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, now, you see other metals and even ivory and other things from other states. I, I, I don't know how they did all grades of stuff like that. Later Pennsylvania rifles, they did it. And if, when you get up to the 18, when you get up to the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, mm -hmm. you can find almost anything. You find. I've even seen pearl. Am I right? Uh, yeah. You see, you see all grades of stuff. But not on these rifles, and not on these backcountry North Carolina rifles. Yes, sir. I appreciate seeing all those Kennedy rifles, as I am the sixth great grandson of John Alexander Kennedy. <laughs> Um, and, uh, now, did you come, did you come down through David, or did you come through one of the other brothers? I come down through. Well, it would, it would have been John Kennedy, uh -huh. and uh, John, let's see, Enoch Spinks and Enoch Kennedy, Kyle Person Kennedy, come down through that route, run over there. But yeah, it was uh, the original neighbor of Robbins, and uh, I had one of them. I had one of the double barrels until they got stolen. Oh, and, and, um, by the way, any, and, and I'm, I'm not here to haunt my book, but then again, I, I'm, I'm trying to pay for it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a politician. <laughs> uh, I have uh, all the products that we looked at, and all the photographs we saw here today, along with us, uh, Kenneth Orr did my photography. 1200 and Keith and I worked elbow to elbow on this thing for many, many years. Uh, all, I do have a book for $100 for anybody that's interested. And when they go out of print, they're going to be selling for four or $500. That's what happened with all these Deputy Marks books. But anybody that's interested in that. Then Arne Capel has a uh, book in the back just on Kennedy and Kennedy history, and those are $200. I told Aaron, he asked permission about bringing them. I said, sure, bring those. I said, yeah, I'll tell them about those $200 books, and then they'll come over and see me about my $100 books. <laughs> but, but they are, too. Uh, mine covers all the schools, but it covers every one of those. Rhymes. Every photograph that we looked at today is in my book, if not. But there's obviously a whole lot more. There's, uh, we, only, we only touched on just a little small bit of that. Any other questions?
uh, historical questions about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.